Hello, I'm Locke Meredith. I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Legal Lines where my guest is Burl Kane. He is the former warden of Angola Prison, the largest maximum security prison in America, 6,000 inmates. And he took that place which was ridden with violence and destroyed lives and turned it into a place of peace and healthy relationships inside and out. How? God. So join us on the next Legal Lines with Burl Kane, former warden of Angola Prison. Legal Lines has interviewed Louisiana Supreme Court justices, appellate trial court judges, federal, state, and local government leaders, including U.S. Senators and Congress members. Watch at Lock Merida, Sean Fagan and Associates website, LockMeredith.com or Cox Channel 1004. At Lock Meredith, Sean Fagan and Associates, it's an honor and a privilege if you choose us to serve you. We serve you with respect, dedication, and an unwavering commitment. We serve you by working hard and striving to get you the best possible results. We serve you using 60 plus years of legal knowledge, experience, and relationships. At Lock Merit of Sean Fagan Associates, we believe that life is about relationships, and it's the mission and ministry of all of us to serve you. Lock Mayor to Sean Fagan and Associates has served our community by airing Legal Lines, a community educational program for 18 years weekly to Baton Rouge and the surrounding areas. Watch Legal Lines at LockMeredith.com or Cox Channel 1004. Hello, welcome to Legal Lines. I am very happy, extremely happy to have on the show for the first time, Burl Kane. He is the former warden of Angola Prison, was there for decades, I think, uh, what, 30 years? 22 years. 22 years. Um, and we're going to talk about his, his time there and basically how it turned into a ministry field. Burl, I, do you know how to get up? That's all right. I'm, I'm used to doing that. And uh, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you coming on the show. What you've accomplished in your lifetime is remarkable. Kind of give some folks the background, uh, how you got to where you are today, um, and, and you know, how you ended up at the, at the, as warden of Angola. Well, I wound up getting a job in corrections from Edwin Edward way back when because I have a degree in agriculture and needed someone to manage the farms and industries. And so since I had the degree in that and my brother James was a senator, he was right. running ground. He was running for me a little bit there. So uh, I got in. I remember they told me, I can give you the job. I can't help you keep it. <laughs> and so good thing to be told. And I said, don't worry, I can keep it. And so that's how I got in correct. And then from there, then uh, I was unclassified. So then Dave Train went to the election and and I'm going to probably lose my job, what have you. But anyway, uh, I transferred then to be the warden at Dixon. And uh, so that's where I started in 81. And so then you were there what? I was there 13 years. I served more time as a head warden of a prison than anybody in America. 30, I read that. Yeah, 34 years. Long time. A but lot you've of done some amazing work. And who would have ever thought? Because let's tell folks about Angola. It's a maximum security largest maximum security prison in the nation, right? Or was. It is. And, and I, I'm a devout Christian, really. Raised in a Christian home. I hated it for, for a reason, because they made us go to church as little kids every time the door was open. <laughs> and so my mom took me to LSU, and no one from my little school in Vernon Parish, Pitkin, Louisiana, ever went to LSU hardly, but went to McNeese and, and those local colleges. And so I was pretty well lost, but anyway, uh, I kind of went kind of wild there like everybody else that goes to LSU. That's right, but that age. When I became a prison warden, I called my mom. I said, Mom, I'm going to be a prison warden. It's going to be good. And she said, let me tell you one thing. God's going to hold you accountable if they know him. And if you don't, you're going to pay. And I said, yes, ma'am. What was I going to say? The so power that, of a good woman, your mom mm -hmm. and your daddy. It is. It was. And uh, so then uh, I realized pretty quick. But that's when I got to Angola. Dixon was pretty easy. That was like easy prison to run. But Ang Ang Angola's got the worst kind of criminals you got. Well, huh? I didn't want that job. See, and they, Richard Stoller, I'd had the most experience. So he said, you got to go up there and fix it. But he, then he said a good thing to me. He said, you go change it. Don't let it change you. We have got to turn this place around and we have to fix it. Well, I realized moral people don't rape, pilfer, and steal. So I came up with a term, moral rehabilitation. And if I could get a moral... I could get them peaceful, and then we could calm it down. And that's really how we did it. It was morality. That's wonderful. The, the, the background of it, and to think that the largest maximum security prison in the nation becomes, in, in so many ways, your ministry field. Well, there's a reason for that. You see, I think God knew that if we would change Angola, and he knew we would and could, he knows everything, 
then nobody else in America could say they couldn't do it because it was the worst prison. So if it changes, then we can do it too. Quite a testimony. Right. And so that's a God thing. That wasn't old Burl because I didn't fix it. it was he used God you thing. as a screwdriver, huh? I was lucky. I got to paddle a boat and he was steering. It's a, it's a, so, so you get there, you're there for decades. Tell me, tell me how it started, how, how you started what is now in scores of other prisons all over our nation and other countries in the world and hopefully moving to Europe. Well, being an educator, I'm all about education. And so in, I remember death, in death row, they said, well, we don't teach any education in death row. I said, well, because they're going to be executed. I said, well, that's crazy how they learn to read the rules. So we're going to teach education in death row. So it's really a lot of common sense. Just do common sense what's the right thing to do. But anyway, uh, I was crying about higher education, and George Roundtree and T.W. Terrell were there in my office, both of me from George Roundtree from LSU. I think they're both gone now. And they said, we'll get to seminary up here. And I said, you crazy. They won't come here. And they said, yes, they will. Give them a place. And that's how it started. So we brought the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary to Angola, and we had to raise all the money because separate the church and state, no really? tax so, dollars. So it was with donations that you oh, did? Oh, yes. Everything I do is with donations. And see, this saves taxpayers That's so big amazing. Time. I know. To explain how this saved taxpayer money. Well, first of all, you got a four-year degree coming out of there accredited like LSU. Well, explain the college. So, so you, you, in essence, said, we're going to help these guys find God, right? Well, yeah, because I knew that we needed preachers. Because if we had preachers, we could form congregations, and then that would be gangs. And so they would, that would replace the illegal gangs, and I would have gangs for God. Because everybody wants to belong to something. That's why they join right. gangs. That's so right. you create something for them to belong to and be part of, but it's positive and not negative, and there went to violence. And it took a period of time. I remember four years into the seminary, Christmas, the year 2000, I didn't have enough men to change the shift. Christmas. And so I'm going to have to send women into the prison. No women had ever worked inside down in the bowels of Angola. So I got on a radio station. We have our own radio station. Thank you, Jimmy Swaggart. He donated his old war out station to us. Wow. And uh, we that. beefed it up, and that's it. So I could talk to the inmates on the radio. I said, I got news for y'all. There's a woman going to come down to guard y'all. And the good news and the bad news is y'all going to have to let them. And so y'all behave, be good. You know how to act now, so we're going to do this. And uh, because, you know, they, what can a little old 19 or 20 year old guy no. do in a dormitory with 90 folks when 24% of them is aggravated rapists? Because remember, Angola had 4,000 lifers, or had that many when I was there. 4,000 lifers. 4,000 lifers. You had murderers, rapists, the, every, every kind of bad worst. criminal you got. And if you had 50 years left on your sentence, we sent you somewhere else. So hardcore prison. And so that's what we were working with to change. And, and it was, had a horrible reputation, and it was a horrible place. It was. I remember when I was first there, I would run in back up there all the time. They would use a lock in the sock. They would just all kind of crazy stuff, every man for himself. But you see that seminary, and as we started those preachers, those guys becoming pastors, they were teaching community that the beds were your house, the aisles were the streets, visit your next door neighbor in the dorm is your city keep the violence out of your city so they started teaching that then these guys progressed to the point that they even are now teaching anger management one inmate teaching to the others and doing all kind of skills and things that save the taxpayers lots of dollars because they're filling the gap in, in, in essence it created friendships it, cre it created community. relationships it did and then they then the, you got this guy that the he can preach the paint off the wall. I mean, they're good preachers. Well, let's talk about that. So you, you started a Bible college to start pouring into to selected people, or did they volunteer? How did you get the first person to, or the first few people to participate in the, in the whole decide to be a pastor? Well, I had to be sure that it was fair and we didn't pick. We had to let them qualify academically. They had to qualify academically. Okay. And then they, we didn't look at, we had, for instance, 24% of our population was sex offenders, were life sentences. So we let 24% of the seminary students be sex offenders. So therefore, we avoided discrimination at all costs. 
And I learned to do that working closely with the ACLU, believe it or not, because they saw the, the wellness and the, the goodness in the program. All right, we'll continue this on the next segment. This was Locked Meredith with my very special guest, Burl Kane, former warden of Angola. We're talking about ministry to prisoners who are there for life. Be right back. Hello, my name is Collins Meredith. I'm one of the attorneys here at Lock Meredith, Sean Fagan and Associates. One of the many distinguishing factors of our firm is that we are not just one lawyer that you are hiring. We are a team of attorneys. When you hire one of us, we all pull from each other's experiences, knowledge of the law, so that we get you not only a solution to your problems, but the best solution that we can come up with for your problems. So for that reason and many others, I hope that you hire our firm. Hi, my name is Mitchell Meredith. I'm one of the associate attorneys here at Lock Meredith, Sean Fagan and Associates. One of the reasons I love this firm is that the moment you walk through the doors, you're so much more than business. You're family, which means we're going to fight for you as if you're family. At the end of the day, I think what distinguishes our firm from others is we're a firm that is truly personal, professional, and proven. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm very pleased to have on the show the first time Burl Kane. He is the former warden of Angola Prison, one of the largest, well, actually the largest maximum security prison in the nation. Burl, you were talking about uh, kind of, it was a, in a horrible disarray, very violent. You got there, it was a mess, and over time it changed, and you changed it because you introduced uh, a ministry college, a pastoral college, four-year program, getting ordained, the whole bit. Explain to folks how that affected the inmates and the guards and everybody involved with the prison. Well, when I sell this into other states now, and that's what I do, we'll talk about that later, everybody said, well, did the guards push back? I said, no, they didn't push back. And the reason was they were more Christians than we realized because they were just having to put on another cap to run the prison and be tough and, you know, iron about it. And all of a sudden, you see they're not. They're really good, fine men that, are, that love God, and you have a lot of them in there. Plus, I made one point. I said, anybody that fights this seminary, when you get up to the pearly gates and see St. Peter, you're going to be fighting God, and you're going to be answering for it. So I wouldn't be guilty of that. I'd just be all for God here. <laughs> I'd help this happen. <laughs> so I explained it so they could understand it. So they got on board, and everybody was on board, and so we were having school, and uh, they would start having these little Bible studies in the dorms and all, because these guys are all fired up. They're learning Hebrew. They're well, doing they everything. They were reborn, learned. too. I mean, yes. their whole person changed. And then what happened, they, you would have a, someone's mother would die or, or, or something tragic would happen in their family. He's a trained counselor. So he sits on the bed with you all night. The chaplain goes home at 430. So he's just there with nobody. But now the inmates were migrating to them because they could feel their, their psychological need and, and their suffering. And so they became then very important to the population. So then they started preaching. That's when we started building the churches. And I raised about $4 million from the private sector to build the rodeo arena and the churches that are there. You know, they're 6,000 square foot churches. I did not know that. They are. One of them's 12,000. That's big churches. All with, with, all with donated money. No tax dollars. I got 401,000 out of Mexico, believe it or not, and we built the Alamo. The Alamo's inside Angola. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so it was changing the whole culture and the per creating changed. relationships the between... Changed. Not only the inmates, but I guess the inmates even with the guards, huh? It was to the point that you could that the inmates came to me and said, Warren Kane, your mother wouldn't like all this profanity and we need to stop cursing. Now the prisoners came to me and said, I said, Okay, we're gonna all stop cursing. I'm gonna start I won't curse anymore. Nobody else, but there's gonna be sanctions, no more profanity. So you have a whole prison at five thousand when I left six thousand three hundred and twenty five prisoners. And, and 1,200 correctional officers, 1,500 employees, no profanity. Can you believe that? No, it's incredible. And then, I mean, I call it a miracle. You I, could bring I, I your daughter. You, call you could bring your daughter, 15 years old, 10 years old, no whistles, no cat calls, no graffiti, no gangs, walk through death row, walk anywhere in the prison, perfectly safe. That's why we could expand the rodeo. See, we rebuilt that arena. It seats 11,000, but we were bringing in 15,000. And we were generating $4 million a year out of the rodeo in the, from a private sector again. Unbelievable. So, so you changed the entire culture and relationships inside the prison. Tell me how it affected the community 
outside the prison, the families of the prisoners. And, and if they, I mean, most of these guys were in for a long, long time. Well, I remember Lloyd Lindsay was the superintendent of education at the time, and he was real happy because we were paying taxes and he was going to the school. <laughs> <laughs> So Angola was generating money for the public school big time with all those sales at arts and crafts. From that four million dollars, about a million I, with arts and crafts. I gotta assume though, when when the kids or the family came in and saw Dad and he was changed and and he cared about them, um, it created a whole new relationship between the family and the inmate. It did, and what happened is we knew they were changed when they would want to say they were sorry to the victim's family. And we also knew because their children are seven times more apt to go to prison than other people's children. You mentioned your two sons work for you. Yes, sir. The children follow in their, fa in their parents, you know, what they do. A lot fireman, of, you want to be a fireman. A Policeman, be a policeman. Criminal, be a criminal. So therefore, we started through Malachi Dad, a program it's been, that's in 15 states now, started in Angola, where they would mentor their children at home with letters and so forth, just like if you're a soldier in Iraq, you still are a dad. You're in prison, you can still be a dad. So we created those programs called Malachi Dad in the Iwana system, and so then we were helping the community. And so the other thing that was really good is I had so many preachers, bro. it's amazing. And I wasn't that smart, but we just kept, I got God in, was in, control. in the shower. I thought about the missionaries and that was because I had too many preachers and I need to send them somewhere else. And I said, I'll well, send them I to the other that. You had too many preachers I had who too were many preachers. inmates in Angola. I did. And it was everywhere. We had them on all the work crews and they'd say, oh, you can't be cursing in front of the preacher. You know, we, that's, that's why all that was happening. And they were, they were all spread out through the prison. So then we, I called Jimmy LeBlanc. He didn't want any inmate preachers at first, but I talked him into, he's a dear friend, I talked him into taking two and then he took them and then immediately his culture started changing. So we knew we were on to it. So then all the prison in Louisiana now have missionaries. We call them field ministers now. And, so and they then, travel amongst the prisons. Right, and then all of a sudden they heard about this in Texas and some dude came over to see me and he saw it. He went back and got the Lieutenant Governor, now Dan Patrick and Senator Whitmire to come to Angola. And they sit there in a church house full of 800 prisoners. And Senator Whitmire said, where's the guard? I said, we don't need any guard. They're over there in the dorm. We all cool right here. He went over to the wall and got by the wall because it was <laughs> close to a door or window. Huh? He did. <laughs> then he looked at me and he said, I never saw so many prisoners with life sentences smiling. I said, it's a culture change. You need to do this in Texas. So boom, we went to Texas and it's incredible. It's in there in 34 prisons now in Texas, but now we all over the place. And, and you've got a map that shows, do, do you not? That I shows... do, I have a map, and the map shows, uh, you can kind of hold it, the little the... dots are all the states so this that we're is, in. So this is a map of the locations of all? Right, we have seminaries and all those. I started Global Prison Seminary Foundation. God run me out of Angola, really, because he knew I'd go do all this stuff and spread it <laughs> everywhere else. And so I have one in Massachusetts, it's an Assembly of God seminary, and I have one in Oregon, I'm in Wisconsin, I got Illinois, I got them all over the country, and I'm working hard to do more. And the Cayman Islands is starting, and that's going to take us to the United Kingdom, and we'll be in Europe. And the real culture change for prisons in America is is this. And we have the research book right here from Baylor. I raised $650,000. This little book for Baylor to do the research to prove that it worked. Because in corrections and anywhere, everybody wants evidence-based research that your program works. And the name of the book is Angola Prison Seminary. That's it. That's the bottom line. That's the book. So, that, so, so you created a seminary inside Angola, created so many preacher, inmate preachers that you had to send them to other prisons, first in our state and then all over the uh, nation. Did, and it's happening all over the country now. And, uh, I have so much demand I can't keep up. So my nonprofit working hard. I have about six people working for us now. So uh, that's what we do and it's working, it's good. Well, it's remarkable what you're accomplishing. So, so tell me about the ministries reach, the, the, you mentioned Awana, okay? I assume that you're plugged into several different groups and, and tell me what they do. How do people participate? We'll, we'll end this on the next segment, discuss it on the next segment. Okay, good. Be right back. This is Lock Merritt of Legal Lines. Merle Kane, former Angola Warden, talking about God in prison. We'll be right back. 
Lock Mayor Deshaun Fagan and Associates has served our community by airing Legal Lines, a community educational program for 18 years weekly to Baton Rouge and the surrounding areas. Watch Legal Lines at LockMeredith.com or Cox Channel 1004. Hello, my name is Sean Fagan. And you know, one of the most important considerations in hiring an attorney is considering trust. I believe at our firm, our results speak for themselves. Most of the people we represent come from past clients who have referred friends, family members, other people they love to us to represent them in the same way we represented the persons who referred them. It's the greatest compliment any law firm could get. And I believe that if you come to our firm, we'll earn your trust. Legal Minds has interviewed Louisiana Supreme Court justices, appellate trial court judges, federal, state, and local government leaders, including U.S. Senators and Congress members. Watch at Lock Meredith, Sean Fagan & Associates website, LockMeredith.com or Cox Channel 1004. Welcome back to Legal Minds. I'm Lock Meredith, and again, extraordinarily pleased to have on the show for the first time, Burl Kane. He is the former warden of Angola Prison, largest maximum security prison in Louisiana and the nation. Well, let's dive back in. You were talking about how you changed the culture uh, with God and, and these pastors. You, they're four-year programs. They're ordained. They're plugging into all the folks there, the guards' relationships with inmates, inmates' relationships with each other, and then outside into their own families. It's been Indeed. adopted all over the nation in multiple states. Um, you were talking about how the, the fathers could remain fathers to their children. It, do they have they uh, used Skype yet? Because now you can actually see each other. We didn't, and we should have, and we could have, and we I hope they will because it would bring, you could put the Skype battery of televisions in the in a church area, and then they could come to the church activities room or what have you, and visit with their relative at Angola or in any prison, and then uh, and and you would be getting them in the church. You'd be saving tax dollars with correctional officers, and you'd be saving the the people who have relatives in prison dollars traveling to the prison. Do you know what the reason was not to allow it? No, I just don't think we got there yet. I think it'll get there. I wish it would, and then you got to watch out that do it in the churches and keep the cost down because they could help it. help afford it and the people wouldn't have to. You're going to get a company that's going to come in and try to do it and all that stuff costs so much. Well, so, so tell me how people participate in this ministry to prisoners. I've got friends, Whitney Alexander, Bill Barkas, many others who've told me for years what a wonderful program that's going on there. How do folks participate face-to-face -face with, with the prison and prisoners? And then how do they participate outside in, in the community and society in general? And then finally, how do they get money if they want well, to? Well, this thing is this. We have to keep separation of church and state. Everything I've talked about has not used any tax dollars. Got it. So we raise and, all But you're funds. saving tax money. We're saving tax dollars big time because the violence itself being down means less lawsuits, less medical bills, less, less, less in the contentness of the prisoners. But the other thing is it does cost money and every state's trying to do it. And so I run a nonprofit, Global Prison Seminaries Foundation, and our address is 30490 Trace Lane, Walker, Louisiana. Okay, and we'll get that and that's on our the headquarters. And uh, but then they have to have money here. We have to have every year it costs about seventy, eighty thousand dollars to pay for the seminary at Angola. Now let's cover one more thing right quick. Okay. We don't care what religion you are. I saw that. I was going to bring the question yeah. up. I'm glad you brought it up. So, yes. we, so this is not limited to Christianity. No, most religions are moral and have morality. So we don't care about the theology so much because the prison has to be like Baton Rouge. Every religion is in Baton Rouge. The prison is the Baton Rouge. Every religion is in Angola. Makes a lot of so, sense. So respect Plus them all. Plus it's required. Yeah, and it's the law. And respect them all and let them come. If they want to come to the seminary and be a Muslim and study four years and get a Baptist degree, and some do, they go back and minister to the Muslim because morally they have changed. And so morally, you're changing the Muslim population. So have the other faiths tried to create any kind of seminary programs of, in the prisons that you know of? I'm operating in 17 states now, really? with 17 states just like Angola, just like Louisiana, and I've got 10 more on deck. The Cayman Islands is coming along. I've been to the Dominican Republic, to Brazil. I've been all over the country to do this. And uh, I'll be with the governor Tuesday in Oklahoma, he and I are meeting with the head of correction that we're starting in Oklahoma. We're starting in Missouri this year. We started in Massachusetts this year. We're in Walla Walla, Washington three weeks ago. I was in Portland, Oregon. I'll be in California end of the month in, in January. It's incredible. 
I know, I'm just getting cool riding this airplane all over the place. <laughs> and you're 77 years old. That's right, but I don't have any ailments. So I'm just <laughs> rocking and rolling. Man, you are way better than I am. So, so explain how, if somebody wants to participate with the volunteers going and, and visiting and spending time with, with inmates, how do they do that? We encourage the religious folks to go support those local preachers in those local churches in the prison, the one there in the prison. Because they won't, they compete with each other for for interesting, yeah. Yeah, because just like the church does, so right. they can't talk to each other because they'll steal their congregation. So they got to talk to somebody on the outside like you. So you adopt these preachers and work with them was one good way. But just going to the prison, doing the kairos, doing the prison ministry is all good because they see you. But try to stay out of the pulpit. We want the inmate <laughs> preacher in the pulpit. But just go and listen and talk and sing and encourage. But don't get in the pulpit, because you'll be blessed if you'll let him preach. I have a qu I believe 100% what you just said. So, so are the volunteers able to pour into the families of inmates that they connect with? We have to be careful with that, because you'll start to get the scam and scheming going okay. on, and temptation is, is bad there. But just they have a good prison program. They have good chaplains. Just keep working with them. It's all supporting it. But this thing is alive and well and doing good. Now, look. We couldn't get enough graduates from high school to, to feed the seminary, so we started K through 12 with inmate teachers. They have a degree from LSU, I mean, from, just like LSU from the seminary, and all you have to do is be able to pass a GED, so it doesn't have to be a certified teacher, so these inmates were teaching K through 12, and they were passing their, G, their, passing their GED, boom. And so that saved a lot of tax dollars, too, because you had a whole other school functioning. Well, you, and you're also, so not everybody that's in Angola stays there for the rest of their life, is No, it? they don't. So some, some 70 of them got out, okay, and thank God for that. And so we just starting a program because we want these, the, pro, the whole deal was to get them back into urban areas and change the urban areas where you have the drive-by shooting, the drugs and all that. That's where they came from. Now, they're equipped to go back into that area. And in the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary just raised $30,000, and Dr. Dukes, who worked for me in my, in my nonprofit, is going to be working with them, with us, and they're going to be trying to place these inmate graduates back in the community as associate or assistant pastors in the urban areas, and we're going to hope that the suburban churches will support them financially to keep them in the community. And that's going to link the suburban and the urban church together and heal our communities. Amen. Amen. This book that you also brought with you is called Cain's Redemption. And this, you talked about the studies before by Baylor in Texas, and that's what this one's about. This one's about, the, I guess, the whole history and how this has happened. Um, talk about the fact that the bottom line is this has been studied for six years by yes. Baylor. They've established scientifically or with stats and numbers and, and history and proof that this works. That's why all these states why doing it. all over the nation are adopting it in other countries. They are. It's an amazing thing. So, so what else can people do to participate? Well, the main thing is, is we need prayer, we need open doors, and we need money because it costs a lot to keep this thing going. You said 80000 a year? 80000 a year for this one. Now, just see, for the one in, in Angola? Just here. The one in Texas is running four cohorts. The one in Angola is one cohort. You just get on the circle and you get up and you graduate when you get four in. But in Texas, 200000 Okay, and you get up north, they're more expensive. So as far as the money we raise in from non, for all the different nonprofits under our umbrella, these are all under our umbrella. Got it. And I'm going to have a seminar in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Michigan the, in, in May, and all these people are coming together, and we're going to have people there to help and do and have sessions and so forth for two days. All this is probably raising fifteen, twenty million dollars to keep all this Good stuff going. Gosh, it's a wonderful ministry, Merle. Thank you so much. I thank really you. appreciate everything you've done for Louisiana, the inmates, their families, society, and you got our prayers. Thank you. This is Lock Mayor with Legal Lines, Merle Kane, former warden of Angola Prison. Thank you for being with us. Merry Christmas. <laughs>